So uh, if you use the DVD rental service uh, Netflix, or, or even if you don't use it, you may have heard of the uh, Netflix prize. Uh, this is this system whereby the company uh, awarded a million dollars to uh, the group or individual that improved their recommendation algorithm, which is called Cinematch, by a factor of, of 10%. And, and this actually just happened within the last month. It had been going on for some time. Uh, about a year ago, um, in the New York Times Magazine, Clive Thompson wrote a piece about this process as it was going on. And it turned out that a 10% improvement uh, was actually way harder uh, than it seemed. And one of the reasons was uh, what, what, what Clive called the Napoleon Dynamite problem. And it goes like this. Here's, here's Clive from the, from the magazine. Uh, it's maddeningly hard to determine how much people will like Napoleon Dynamite. When uh, Bertoni, this is one of the guys who we interviewed, he was working on the, uh, the algorithm, runs his, uh, uh, runs his algorithms on regular hits like Lethal Weapon or Miscongeniality and tries to predict how any given Netflix user will rate them, he's usually within eight-tenths of a star. But with films like Napoleon Dynamite, he's off by an average of 1.2 stars. So this was a year ago. Uh, recently, uh, just a, a month or two ago, uh, Netflix awarded the prize, and uh, here are the guys enjoying their, their checks. Kind of a lot of them. It makes the million dollars uh, not, not go quite as far, but collaboration is, is good, in, except if there's a million dollar prize. Um, anyway, uh, there's a guy named Tom Slee, who's, who's, a, who's an author, a Canadian author, and he did an analysis of the algorithm that the winners came up with. It was different from the, the Len Bertoni uh, algorithm. And what he found was that uh, Napoleon Dynamite still has a, a way higher error rate than any of the other movies who, that have been rated this many times, more than 50,000 times. And, and in fact, it's just as bad as it was a year ago when, uh, when Thompson did this, this piece on, on Bertoni. Now, uh, when, you, when you ask people about this, when they talk about the article, um, many folks conclude that, well, Napoleon Dynamite, it's hard to rate because it's just really quirky. And this is a totally unsatisfying explanation because it's, it's tautological. It's like saying, Napoleon Dynamite is hard to predict because it's a hard to predict movie. But why is it hard to predict? And I think the reason that um, people have trouble with the film is that it, it speaks only kind of partly through its narrative and a large part of the meaning is, is somehow embedded in other things that we're not used to finding legible like costume design and production design. And there's all this kind of incoherent stuff. Um, you know, like, like the temporal anomalies, you know, the, the side ponytail and the moon boots and the trapper keeper in the same context as the internet and the sort of contemporary slang. And in fact, the, the film gives us a, a very specific temporal location and it's just, it's just very confusing. And when, the, when the, the filmmakers were asked, sort of, hey, w when did this movie take place? I can't, can't quite place it. Um, reportedly, the response was Idaho. And this is an amazing clue about both the, the, the meaning of the film and also why it's, it's maybe so hard to pin down. It, it's kind of a, a mise en a beam of, of nested statements about a really weird kind of alienation, a sort of, sort of blithe, earnest alienation. And, and it, it sits on multiple scales at the level of the, this, this small town in Idaho in which you know, those things kind of take place at different scales on, on the level of the family or of the individual. And it kind of is setting these themes in relief um, against its production design. And so, you know, in some ways, the, the, the film feels like hipster irony. And I think people either like it or hate it because it feels like hipster irony. But then at the same time, it's, it's really a kind of earnest portrait of this, um, this kind of strangely weird alienation of uh, living uh, so far off the grid, uh, but still within civilization. And people don't, want to, don't know what to make of it because it's performing these things simultaneously. So um, there's a concept in, uh, in art and optics called anamorphosis, and it's usually described like this. Uh, an, an anamorphic image is one that appears distorted unless it's viewed at a special angle or with a, a special instrument. And there are lots of examples of this. In fact, speaking of cinema, because this is a mobile games panel, uh, cinematic projection often uses this thing called anamorphic widescreen. And it, it's, it's a, there's an, an optical distortion on the, on the camera lens that allows it to squash that wide image onto the narrow 35-millimeter uh, film, and then the projector corrects the distortion so that it becomes wide again. But in art, um, there are usually two kinds of anamorphosis, uh, uh, catoptric uh, anamorphosis, which uses these like cylindrical or conical mirrors to transform a distorted image into a legible one. And there's all sorts of histories of coding and things that use these. And an, an oblique uh, anamorphosis, um, in which the image has to be viewed uh, from a position different from the usual 
straight ahead view. This is a, a very famous example of oblique anamorphosis. It's a painting by Hans Holbein from 1533 called The Ambassadors. And it depicts two wealthy, uh, educated, and, and powerful young men. And, and it follows in this long tradition of, of paintings that show learned men with books and instruments of, of the elite. Um, but it also functions as a, uh, a disruption of that idea, a memento mori, in which the, the, there's this kind of stain across the image, which you see at the bottom. And uh, in the, if, this, if this, this painting is viewed uh, from the correct angle, um, then it becomes visible as a, as a skull. You, you sort of see it here in the, in the bottom. And uh, oops, I'm not ready for Lacan yet. Uh, so, um, so, so here it is in, uh, in, uh, in its uh, straight on view. And you, you kind of see that there's something wrong with the painting, but you're not quite sure what it is. And then upon, upon you know, moving, moving beyond the painting and glancing back at it, you, you, would, you would see this, this skull, which sort of disrupts the idea of what the painting is all about in its tradition. Um, now, um, everybody's favorite psychoanalyst, uh, Jacques Lacan, would, would later use this example, uh, Holbein's uh, uh, painting in particular, uh, as an example of, of the gaze which he was obsessed with. And he also adapted it into his famous restatement of Descartes' cogito, which goes like this, I, I think of what I am where I do not think to think, um, or, or as, as Zizek restated it, kind of generalizing this idea. Um, sometimes we have to, to look awry in order to see things in their clear and distinct form. We need to look at them um, differently and disturbed. Now, uh, yesterday, um, uh, Kevin Slavin talked about the way that games can introduce noise into situations and used this example of the, the absent uh, noise, analog noise, on the, uh, the Sprint, the original Sprint digital phone lines. And you know, there's, a, there's a way in which anamorphosis is a, is a kind of noise but it's one that serves a, a more specific purpose. Um, and it's, this is what I want to relate to, uh, to mobile game design. So in my conception, games are models of, of systems. And those systems force players to reconcile uh, ideas about, uh, about, uh, about the systems that the game represents. So you know, in a game, uh, you approach it, and you're a player. And you've got some idea about how something operates. And that idea has certain kinds of properties. And then um, the game also has some, some model of the world that it constructs, and, and that model has, has its own properties. And um, when you play the game, those two models are put into relief. And you, know, you, you kind of see, gosh, well, I've got this conception of how something operates, and, and the game seems to have this other one. And, and you know, they kind of converge and diverge in different ways. And um, when you play a game critically, then you, you, know, you sort of contend with the mismatches. Uh, between your internal models and, and the ludic models in the game. And, and it may be a startling or distressing or you disagree with it or what have you. Uh, in the past, I've, I've called this, this dynamic, this kind of mismatch of models, uh, simulation fever. <laughs> now, if, if we kind of collapse the, the representation and the situation that it represents so that they're, they're closer together, then the dissonances might become even more apparent. Um, and so, and thereby, the, 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 the deliberation could be, could be amplified. And we could say that mobile devices, in particular, offer an opportunity to make this possible because they, they allow us to put ourselves in more specific situations, uh, situations that may match those that the game's model is attempting to depict. So uh, for example, in this game called uh, Cruel to be Kind that uh, Jane McGonigal and I designed, um, the game is essentially assassin. But in, instead of killing people, you compliment them. And you play it on the street. And uh, players don't know who is playing the game, so they end up um, you know, complimenting random strangers. And they realize in so doing that uh, they, they ordinarily don't have any relationship whatsoever with these people. So there's this kind of coupling between the experience uh, of the game and the rules of the game and uh, a sort of social experience that's disrupted. Uh, in fact, uh, Jane has this idea about uh, alternate reality games. I mean, we, we hear this word thrown around quite a lot now. But in, in her original conception of this, of this idea, um, Alternate reality games are not fantasy worlds that we kind of leave our real world in order to enter, but sort of this, this interchange of different worlds that we can move between to show us new choices. And we might conclude that the, the salient feature of mobile games is not really that they are mobile, but that they can be situated in an arbitrary way. And then you know, we begin to kind of build these wormholes between two worlds in which one begins to bleed and seep uh, into the other, making them kind of hum. So um, lately, we've been hearing a lot about this in terms of how games can you know, add this kind of layer of fun or interest atop ordinary experiences to make them um, less afflictive because our lives suck and we want them to be better. 
But the problem with this is that it doesn't really add any sort of critical perspective on uh, the practice itself of what you're doing. Um, it doesn't add any noise, if you want to use uh, Slavin's word for it. So take, for example, uh, this thing called Foursquare. This is a game that you can play on your mobile phone when you go out, uh, like to the club that we saw the, the girls grinding at. And uh, you, can, uh, you can check in and find out who is nearby. It's kind of like dodgeball, if you remember that. Um, but there's this, this layer of gaminess atop. And you know when you check in, you get points. And if you do certain tasks, then you can get these, these badges, like you see here, like little rewards. Uh, and you can, if you check in enough at the same place more than other people, then you become the mayor of the place. And, and it sends out notices to, to your Twitter stream and things like that. So if we kind of take this game and uh, throw it on top of this model uh, that I have, the simulation fever model, then it, it works something like this. So the, the player goes, oh, I'm, I'm going out. And, um, and then the game responds, well, you are totally awesome. <laughs> it's a totally smooth space. The game model and the world model are identical, and they're just reinforcing one another. It's like a kind of behaviorist partial reinforcement. Or, or maybe you know, it's like a participation trophy every single day. And you know, if you ask me, this is total bullshit. <laughs> so I was thinking about this, and, and about a year ago at the studio, we, we decided we, we were trying to d design kind of an, an, an anamorphic mobile game. Um, and we did this thing called Jet Set, which we subtitled A Game for Airports. And this was a game that you were going to play in an airport. I travel a lot, so I'm obsessed with travel. And uh, I wanted, wanted to explore that idea using some of these principles that I've been describing. Um, so in the, in the game part of the game, you wait in line. At, so while you're waiting in line at airport security, then you play this game where you wait in line at airport security. And you're trying to keep track of like, things, that, different band items, and they're changing all the time, um, like they really do in, 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 in the ordinary world. Um, and all of the items were, were drawn from real TSA incidents from the past few years, yes, including pressurized cheese. Um, and uh, in addition, the game knows about 100 different airports worldwide. And if you play in those airports and you reach particular score thresholds, then you earn these souvenirs. And we designed um, specific souvenirs for every, every one of these 100 airports that have something to do with the location but are not super obvious, uh, the cola bottle from Atlanta, where I'm from. And there are different levels of these awards, which correspond with frequent flyer loyalty levels, uh, silver, gold, and platinum. Here you see the, the platinum version of the cola bottle snow globe. Uh, and, and then you could download these things to Facebook, where they, they serve as the kind of social capital that, that many of us who are obsessed with, with frequent flyer um, miles and so forth already uh, use in our daily lives. And uh, it's like, look at me. I'm a world traveler. Look at all the places I've been. Here's part of my page. And, and you can also give them to people. Um, you know, we're kind of commenting, too, on the, on the whole gifting mechanism, the di digital goods, virtual goods gifting mechanism. And I hope this would also draw attention to um, use versus ex exchange value in, in travel capital, that idea of what you're bringing home. I, when I go and I travel, and I realize that the most interesting things I bring home are, are the cookies from, from the airplane, which my kids like, and anything else is sort of, sort of meaningless. And you could also take those things when you, when you receive them from someone and download them back down to your iPhone, and you have this, this, this virtual object that you could take along with you. Um, or if you feel like it, you can just hoard um, the, the, uh, the souvenirs that you collect and if you save them up from different airports, because you're so worldly that you've traveled to all these different airports, you can trade them in for, for tangible rewards. Uh, so here's some that we've done in the past. We tried to switch them out every now and then. And, but in order to do that, you would have to trade in the, um, the social capital you get for demonstrating all of the places that you've been. And this seemed like an, you know, an interesting way of, of setting in relief the, the whole problem of desiring to travel. Uh, wanting to be out in the world and, and, and be worldly, and then uh, the guilt and misery of the actual experience and how you kind of try to mediate between those. Um, but we, we sort of like failed utterly uh, at doing this, and I, I think that the reason is actually the same as the Napoleon Dynamite problem. You know, for one thing, we only explored one of the, the many anamorphic wormholes, if you will, that, that exist between uh, my idea of why I travel and what, what it means to be a business traveler and uh, the experience itself. And we translated this one queuing experience, um, but we really needed more hooks because uh, this, is, this is one moment. And, and it had to be these mundane kind of experiences because it's all mundane experiences at the airport. It's, you know, you're waiting in security, and then you're, um, you're waiting in the lounge, and then you're waiting to get on the plane, and then you're waiting in your seat on the plane, and then you're just sitting there on the plane, uh, and then you're waiting to get off, and then you're waiting for your baggage, and all of that sort of stuff, that, that sort of ordinary mundane meaninglessness of travel was what I wanted to get at, and we, we weren't able to reinforce it enough, so it kind of read as this, 
as the satire of, uh, of airport security, which is what it was, but it wasn't enough. There are reasons for that, but I'll skip them for now. And then, of course, and this is the, the thing that's so different from Foursquare, when you play Jet Set well, you completely break the experience because you, know, you go to your home airport and you've earned the platinum medal or whatever, and you go there all the time because that's where you fly out of, and the game becomes completely valueless. You don't want to play it anymore because it's not rewarding you. It's not saying, oh, you, look how awesome you are. Look where you're going. Um, which actually was, was a part of the experience I wanted it to create, but this, this didn't code well uh, for the players who, had, who were wanting that reinforcement of, uh, of a Foursquare style experience. So, you know, one answer, there's a lot we could say about this, but one answer may lie in, uh, in Holbein's stain, that there needs to be some sort of signal that explicitly invites us to read the game model and the world model against one another. And we could imagine kind of inserting the mobile device as the, um, the anamorphic operator, the anamorphic tool. We could imagine ourselves doing this sort of anamorphic game design process in which um, we're trying to set up these mirrors to see the distorted world in new form rather than to use the device as a kind of uh, lens or window that just reveals the subterranean dimensions of the world we expect. So that's it. Thanks.